I would like to introduce our executive director, Mike Carr, just to say a few quick words about the Adirondack Land Trust and the work that we do. Um, Mike will then turn it over to me and I'll introduce Manny and we'll get underway with our exciting presentation. So thank you, Mike. Thanks, Derek. And thank you all for making time to join. We're delighted uh, to have Manny with us today. He's a remarkable professional. I just want to take a minute or two to give you a sense for who the Adirondack Land Trust is and what we do. We're a not-for-profit uh, founded in 1984 that focuses on places that make the park function, not just as an intact ecosystem, but also as a landscape that supports communities. Our supporters and partners have helped us conserve 27,606 acres at 100 sites in 10 counties. And today we have more than 10,000 acres in our deal pipeline. These are farms and forests, waters and wild places that have the power to make the Adirondacks and people healthier. We recognize that as one of the greatest conservation undertakings on earth, the Adirondacks needs a land trust scaled to this region's promise, challenges and opportunities. We're well positioned to rise to the challenge. Not only does our staff collectively have more than 170 years of conservation experience and expertise, but we have a very engaged board, a growing donor base, and the trust of landowners and partners to accelerate the pace of land protection. Finally, we all know that the Adirondack Park is famous for forest preserve, and we've added about 3,500 acres to forever wild public lands, but we also know that private ownerships are critical to holding this landscape together. One of the ways which, in which we're able to inspire people to care for this amazing Adirondack landscape is through photography, which is why we're so thrilled to have Manny join us today, not only to showcase his incredible work, but to generously share his time and process with all of us. So thanks again for joining today. And I'll reintroduce Derek Rogers, our stewardship manager, manager who will introduce our guest, Manny. Thank you, Mike, much appreciated. Uh, yes, as Mike mentioned, I'm the stewardship manager for the land trusts, and um, I'm more of a wildlife photographer, which Manny thinks is incredibly challenging. But when I see Manny's work, I, I, I find it to be the opposite. I think Manny, what Manny does is just mind blowing. So um, with that, happy to introduce Manuel Palacios, who, as you all know, goes by Manny. Manny is a scientist and outdoor photographer based out of upstate New York in the Mohawk River Valley area. For Manny, landscape photography is not just a way to document moments, but a means to express his deep connection to nature and interpret the world around him. With a passion for pushing the boundaries of photography, he is constantly experimenting with new techniques and sharing his knowledge with others, inspiring them to see the world in new ways through the lens of their cameras. Manny's work is a true celebration of the natural world and a testament to the power of photography to connect us to the beauty of nature. For the past few years, Manny has been focusing much of his recent photography work on the Adirondacks. And as Manny puts it, he has made the Adirondack Park his muse and focus. He's worked on capturing the feeling, mood, and drama of the Adirondack landscape. Manny is also a public speaker and he loves bringing his audience with him on his journey through photography in the Adirondacks and beyond. So with that, we are going to experience that. And again, Manny, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. I can direct for the kind introduction and the opportunity to talk to this audience that care about the Adirondacks uh, as much as I do. Um, so today we're going to be talking about winter photography, which I mean, for the past few weeks, uh, we thought it was uh, a little bit uh, hidden from us, but all of the sudden we have winter conditions again, and uh, they're going to be um, just staying with us for a few more days, hopefully for a few more weeks. I'm going to share my screen here. All right. There you go. All right, so I, I, I love always starting my presentations with this uh, quote from, from the late uh, Barry Lopez. It says, landscape is the culture that contains all human cultures. 
And what, what Barry Lopez meant with that quote is that landscape is our reference point. It is, the sum, it is that something that we all, we all humans refer to. We all grow with the landscape and what we do with it uh, is how we relate to each other. Um, meaning that there is not only one framework to relate to, to each other as humans, there is the frame of, framework of landscape. And this is why it's so important that we preserve it and that we document them as much as we can. So this is the content of the presentation. I'm gonna go through a very short bio so you know where the accent comes from. And uh, we are gonna lay, uh, then talk about the, my photography philosophy, why I shoot, what's my main theme and how I do it. Um, and then some tips and tricks about winter photography that are called, you know, elements of winter photography and some technical considerations that are pretty important. Um, and most of the presentation is going to be behind the shots. So I am going to go through a few images and I'm going to tell you how those images came to be. And it, the main idea is that they work as an inspiration for you guys and, and uh, as a way to see how I approach and see. So a little bio, I was born and raised in La Guaira. Uh, that's a small beach town outside of Caracas, Venezuela. So you can already imagine that when people say, uh, what is an exotic landscape? For me, it's no palms and beach. For me, it's actually winter and fall. So this is why I'm still absolutely fascinated by the fall landscape and by the winter last landscape. So things that I did um, in my small town when I was born, well, I surf a lot. Uh, I did a lot of music too. That was my first uh, way to do art. Um, I play a lot of baseball all the way through college. Uh, I did my, I majored in science, uh, specifically in chemistry. And I did a lot of reading. I was, uh, this was at the, the pre-Google uh, time. So there was a lot of uh, reading involved uh, in, in, in my life, I guess. And we used to have a library at home and that was the place where, you know, I, I was lucky enough that I had a, lot, a bunch of books and photography books too, because my dad was a, a photography lover. So in 2004, uh, cannot believe it was almost 20 years ago, I moved to Ohio to pursue my graduate studies where I got a PhD in photochemical sciences. Then in 2009, I moved to Boston and I did uh, my postdoc in bioanalytical chemistry. And in 2011, I moved to the capital region and that's how I got to New York. I, I was working for about six years in the chemical sensing lab at GE Global Research. Today, I work as a consultant uh, for eigenvector research and I, I'm a data scientist and chemometrician. So meaning I am, a, 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 if we want to use the, the fancy words now there, working on artificial intelligence in chemistry problems. So as I, as I mentioned before, because it was the pre-Google era, um, my access to photography was through the books that my dad had in the library. And that's how I got uh, acquainted with Newman, you know, Ansel Adams, Park Jin Jensen, Michael Kenna, to name a few. These were the names that actually stuck with me. When I started putting this presentation together, I, these four names were the ones that came coming back to me. And, and the reason is because I mean that the photography is amazing. Uh, it, has turned dense time. And even though most of, actually all of their work is black and white, uh, it doesn't need any color to have a high impact. And this is important when you are trying to learn photography and to understand how the, the, the medium actually uh, expresses itself. So I, I will say later, but go back and study the masters because there is a lot to be learned still from them. So the question is how, how I pick up my first DSLR, my first camera. Uh, in 2010, uh, I had a new subject on the way and I decided to pick up my first DSLR. And this is Sophia, my daughter. She is uh, right now 13. And I decided to, you know, that, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to document her I, in, in the lab. As you can see, I, was a, I, I am a photochemical scientist. So there was a lot of optics um, and optical setups in my, in, while I was doing my PhD and also while, while I was doing my postdoc. So I was well acquainted with optics. So picking up the camera 
was not a big problem. I understood how the camera worked uh, the first moment. Now, what I didn't know was to how to make art and how to properly make an exposure. And that's what I had to learn in time. So uh, when Sophia turned about five years old, she asked me to please not point the camera at her so, so much. So I had to kind of look for, a, I always make the joke that I had to look for a subject that wouldn't talk back. And that was about the first time that I actually discovered the Adirondacks. Uh, this is me and my wife uh, in, in Black Mountain in Lake George. And I remember clear that day. This, I, I will say that this is the day that my, my landscape photography journey started. And it was because I remember coming back from, from that hike and loading the photos and realizing these photos don't look exactly like what I saw and much less like what I felt. So where is the disconnect? How, what I should do, how I can convey that message in, in my photos. So that's how the journey actually started. And um, I do have to, to say uh, in Sophia's, my daughter's credit, that just a few months ago, like three months ago, into it, I think it was November, last November, she let me actually point the camera back at her and I finally got some good set of photos that really represents uh, who she is. And this is very important. And the reason why I show this is because I really want to convey the, the, the idea that photography is a relationship. It's not about the photographer. It is about the, the relation between the photographer and the subject. If there is no connection there, you are not going to see it in the photograph. And for many years, I tried to keep photographing Sophie, but she wouldn't really, you know, get into it. And just recently, she let me get this set of photographs, and I, I love them, and I think that I got really lucky this time. So in 2016, uh, I established uh, Zone 3 Photography. The reason why I call it Zone 3 is because at the moment, I started uh, with uh, astrophotography and mostly night photography. So most of my photos in the um, zone system that, that was invented by Ansel Adams, you can see here the scale, most of the pixels in my photos were in the zone three, that basically that it's this car as average dark materials and low values showing adequate texture. So I realized that the hardest thing for in my night photography was to pick up those textures and that they will, you know, come come to life, even though they were really dark. So they were giving me such a hard time that I decided to name my photography company after it. So some three photo, uh, that, I mean, my, my business mostly uh, image licensing and printing, of course. Uh, I do a lot of uh, uh, very limited uh, uh, printed editions of my photos. Uh, I used to do some time-lapse video. I haven't done much lately, but I still, uh, from time to time, license some of those. Uh, I do a lot of freelance photography service. When people call me or when some magazines need uh, material, I can go out and, and, and shoot those projects. Um, I also do one-on-one uh, -on -one or one-to-one on-field -one, uh, classes. Uh, these, I used to do a, a, smaller, a, a little bit larger workshops, but I decided that um, I didn't want to have any kind of impact in the landscape that I was trying to use for people to shoot. So, because I mean, that's really what we are doing. We are using the landscape where we are getting a permission from the landscape for us to photograph it. So sometimes when you have a group of five or 10 people, if, if the area is not adequately prepared to receive that kind of traffic, uh, it can get damaged. So I decided to, now reduce, and I usually just take two or three people on the field. It's more expensive for everybody, but at the end, um, it's better for the landscape. And last but not least, I do a lot of post-processing classes. This is a, one of the, my favorite things, and I mean, we can do it online, so there, there's no damage to anybody, and we learn a lot. Uh, these are a few of the Adirondack Life magazine covers that I've gotten, and it's been great working with them. Uh, all right, so let's go to my photography philosophy. So I say I am a creative photographer. It sounds redundant. Uh, it should be redundant, but this is, in a, this, this is just supposed to be in a documentary photographer. Um, my, my intention is not to document a moment. 
And there are, you will find a lot of photographers that say, I want people to feel like they are there uh, when they, they look at my photo. That is not my objective. My objective is to show people how I felt when I was there. So the, and, and you know, the, the, the moment that you make it about you and your relationship with the landscape, I feel like you're gonna be um, able to convey an emotion instead of just depicting the, the, the landscape per se and document it. So that's what I'd say, you know, what I wanted to portray my emotional connection with the landscape uh, and basically my interpretation with the scene. I will always look for tonal balance so the composition makes sense and it tells a story. Um, that, that's why there are certain times of the day that I don't want to take pictures just because the, the light is too harsh and it makes it hard for me to, to show a, a, a balance. If I have very dark shadows and very bright highlights, it is gonna be really hard. So that's the kind of um, situations, light situations that I will be seeking. Um, I don't care as much about color accuracy, but more about a color palette that works. That is important for me too. Sometimes uh, people will, <laughs> mostly fall, people will tend to just, you know, increase the saturation to a million. And um, even though that might look very colorful, it doesn't work really aesthetically, at least for my aesthetics. And I will always try to balance the colors so everything works. Um, not, not, and, and the colors don't have to be exactly right. Sometimes I will uh, tune a little bit the color so we have a better match, uh, you know, of, of in, in color theory. Um, I don't add anything to my photos and I don't, I don't do composites. Uh, what that means is that, you know, I, I won't take a photo that I took in the Adirondacks and then put a sky that I shot in, uh, in California or anything like that. I mean, everything that you're gonna see in my photos was in that, in, in, in that I would say time window because sometimes I do, or I do time blends. That means that, for example, I would set up a camera at twilight and take a photo of the foreground. So I have a little bit more light and then wait for the, let's say the Milky Way to come and then shoot the Milky Way and put those photos together. Uh, but everything happened in the same time frame and definitely in the same location. Uh, I definitely don't subscribe to the something from nothing philosophy. Uh, this is something that, that you will see out there with very famous photographers, that's what they do. You know, they, they can go to these places and make absolutely amaz amazing images uh, because they are really good in Photoshop. And I totally respect that. It's a great form of art, but it's not what I do, that's all. And I, I will say that it's gonna get tricky from here on as we uh, you know, go into this AI, artificial intelligence era, where this is the kind of stuff where artificial intelligence will be able to make a difference. You will basically have a scene that is shot in summer and you're gonna be able to say, show me this scene in winter and artificial intelligence will do it for you. So that's the kind of stuff that that I don't do. Uh, I rather, you know, enjoy the landscape as I am outside. If I want to shoot in winter, I will just show up in winter. Okay, so my seven steps to become a happy and maybe better photographer. And this is something that is really important. And this is something that I really also want to stress. Um, we do this because we want something out of photography. And what we want from out of photography, at least in my case, is just basically the pure pursuit happiness. I am, I, I am doing this uh, because it really makes me happy and I think it makes me a better person. Um, if I get better, photo, uh, better uh, photographs from this and as I improve, I feel rewarded. But the main reason why I'm doing this is really because of the journey. Uh, not because of the photographs. So focus on your journey, enjoy it. Don't worry about, you know, uh, in case of social media, how many likes you are, in case of photo competitions, if you win or not. Uh, you will never see me participating in any photo competition uh, because I mean, it, it, and again, that's something very personal. Uh, for me, it kind of defeats the purpose of photography. Uh, I am doing this not because I want to win awards. I, I am doing this because I love doing it. 
So the first thing, find uh, your motivation. That, that's people, nature, whatever rings with you. Uh, but uh, you really need to find that motivation because that's what is going to make you wake up in the middle of the night at three in the morning to go and hike five miles in, in the cold. So you need that. You really need the motivation. Uh, the second is find your inspiration. Uh, nerd alert, this is, you know, the research and development of, of art is basically, well, um, what do we want to do with my art? There, are, I, I, I always said, um, and this is, you know, my, my science background uh, talking, there are two ways to know and there are two ways to think outside of the box. One is to know everything that is in the box. And if you know what everything that is in the box, you're going to be able to say, well, I mean, I know that this line of thought is unique and I'm going to pursue that. And the other way is to not, not even care about what's in the box and try to do your own stuff. Uh, the problem is that um, it's very likely that somebody already did it. So you might be missing stuff if you don't look what what's inside in the box. So that's why I always say, you know, go and study the masters, see how they did it, see what rings with you, and then decide what you want to do with your photography. Try new things, try the same compositions that they did. It's absolutely fine to look for, for the iconic shots at the beginning. Uh, later on, you are gonna find your own path, but at the beginning, it's absolutely fine to, find, to, to go and try to reproduce what they did to see if it works for you and to see why it works. Um, I would say overcome the technical aspects. This is, you know, learn to use your camera, you know, learn to expose properly. And the whole idea is that you get it out of the way. When it, when it becomes second nature, you don't want to be in an absolutely amazing sunset at minus 40 uh, Celsius or Fahrenheit, whatever it is, trying to decide how you're going to expose the, the photo. You want that to be second nature. So practice, practice, practice. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Make all the mistakes. So when you really need to have the proper exposure, you can have it. Um, planning, planning and visualization, this is fun. It is really fun. Um, it can work against you sometimes because if you try to put your mind too much into exactly what you want to shoot, it might preclude you from seeing other stuff in the landscape. So think of thinking themes and projects that you want to shoot. Uh, this is something that has helped me a lot. I recently put a, 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 a project, uh, a collection based on the dunes, and it was a, a, a very different, my own take on the, on the dunes in Mesquite in, in Death Valley National Park. And it was because I went there with a mindset of, I am going to see something different, um, and I want to pursue this kind of theme. In my case, it was big lines and stuff like that. Um, be disciplined on the field. This is really important. You know, I mean, sometimes you're going to be shooting with a lot of friends and it's really hard to focus on what you're trying to do, but you have to make it a mantra. Um, get used to do your, your stuff so you get in the flow. The most important thing is that you get into that flow uh, or a state of mind where, where things are start, you know, just you, you start looking for lines, you start looking for geometries in the landscape that will work. You start seeing what the mood and the atmosphere of the of the um, landscape is. So it's very important that you are disciplined on the field. And now be ready to the unexpected and, it's, and just embrace it, you know, and this is what you forget your planning and visualization and any discipline, just run around the, around the landscape and shoot what, what is what the opportunity that you are given. Because uh, there are moments of light that are not going to happen for more than, you know, two minutes. So it is for you to, you know, pick up that tripod or whatever. If you can handheld it, it's fine too. And the final one is learn post-processing. That's the cherry on the cake. It is really important. And more when you are shooting raw images, that you learn how to take the raw file uh, or the, the, you know, the digital negative and make it into a photo that conveys that message that you want to convey. So at the end, I mean, it's important to keep in mind that there is more than photos to, to photography. Um, and I, I stole this one from one of my favorite statisticians and um, Edward Tofte, and he said, to see the ordinary so intensely that the ordinary becomes extraordinary. When I first read this quote, um, I just could think of photography. 
I was like, that's exactly what we want to do. We want to look at the mundane and find ways to portray it uh, in such a way that is amazing, that is interesting, that conveys a message what first told you. So your motivation, as I said before, my first motivation was my daughter and I, I tried to document her and that made me to, you know, learn a lot because as a kid, she moved a lot. I, I needed to learn how to freeze action, how to shoot at very fast, um, at short speeds, but still keeping the quality in the photo and all that stuff. So pick your motivation. It, as soon as you have a good motivation, the rest is gonna come easy. Uh, winter motivation. So this is just to, uh, to you know, tease ourselves uh, that in, on the left here, Parque Nacional uh, Mochima, that's back home. That's how winter looks uh, back home. But when I think of winter, what I think is what is on the right. This is on the on the top of uh, Gothics Mountain. That's the last push for summit with my friend, my friend and a mountaineer, Chris Lang, amazing photographer, by the way. Um, and and that's what that's where I where I want to be. You know, I mean that um, it you know snow being on the top of a mountain uh, is amazing. And if that motivates you, you are gonna be out there in no time. Doesn't matter if you have to wake up at two in the morning. <laughs> All right, inspiration, as I was already say, study the masters, you know, try to understand composition, try to understand light, mood, atmosphere. Um, and the inspiration doesn't have to be only in images and it doesn't have to be only in paintings. Uh, it, you have to look for the stuff that gets you in the right mindset, either music, books. Um, I find myself uh, listening to a lot of Philip Glass, John Luther Adams, John Cage. I, I also listen to a lot of Sigur Ross, Bjork. No wonder I also love Iceland. Um, I, I like no one more, all that landscape kind of uh, uh, that gives you, you know, the sparse, um, the sparsity kind of mindset when, when, when you go into the landscape. All that stuff helps. Uh, read Barry Lopez. I, I gave you already a quote from Barry Lopez. Um, he was an amazing writer and, and he had an amazing relationship with landscape. So it is important that you get yourself into that flow, document yourself, study, because that's the only way that, that we can get better. And of course, shooting. So here's an example from Ansel Adams. And what, what I want you to, whenever you look at these photos, just ask yourself why this photo works, how, um, for example, here we have contrast between the, all the, the branches of the tree cover in, in, in snow against a very flat, uh, textureless background that basically he overexposed on purpose. That is, a, 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 um, I would say, an, a, an artistic tradition. Um, and all those branches are lines that are converging into the trunk. So look at the photos and be critical of them and when you see a photo that you don't like those are really important to study to why this photo doesn't work why i don't like it why it's not giving me anything so it's it can be either you know compositionally or maybe the light is not working atmosphere is not giving you anything so be critical this is another one by michael kenna you see here this is the opposite you have here all the negative space in the world you just have one tree giving you all, all that you need from that subject. You have a line that is converging towards the tree that is in the foreground, and then you just have negative space. It gives you that sense of sparsity, right? That sometimes we relate to winter. That gives you a mood too. So that, that, that's how we are gonna start looking at those pictures. All right, overcome some, some technical aspects. Again, we are not going to, to go too deep into this today. The most important thing is shoot, shoot, shoot. You know, go and practice as much as you can. It has to become second nature. And one thing that is important also is get to know your gear. All lenses are different. Every, uh, every time you get a new lens, it's going to be an, a, a learning experience. <coughs> so go through that. Excuse me. All right, so shutter speed control, the same like when we are shooting in, in the rain, right? <clears throat> you, 
the um, whoa. All right. I hope that you guys didn't lose that. So the same like like when we are shooting in the rain, the longer the depending on how it's snowing, if you are sh uh, shooting in the middle of of a of a storm, depending on how quick is your shot speed you are going to get different kind of textures. And you can see here the same scene shot at 1 60th of a second, 1 25th of a second, and 1 13th of a second. And then you make the, I will shoot all of them. And then I will make the decision on which one I like better. Because I mean, it, it's really hard on the field to make that decision. It really depends on how hard the snow is coming down. Sometimes one thirteenth of a second is going to be too much. You are not going to get any any if if it's coming down really really hard one thirteenth of a second, it's going to be too uh, too slow. You are just going to get a, a it's just going to look like a screen in front of like a like a filter in front of a photo. Now, do not rely on autofocus and more when it's snowing, because it will never find the focus. Period. It's just white contrasting with white, and then you have some uh, snowflakes that are closer to the to to the camera than others, and it's gonna be a mess. Do not rely on that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do not rely uh, on the light meter neither. You can see here a perfect example of that, where the light meter is telling me <clears throat> that the um, the exposure is balanced, but if I look at the at the histogram. It is absolutely underexposed, so I cannot trust this. And here you can see the same the same scene. Now with the histogram that I want to be in the scene in, and you can actually see finally in the back, and the meter is telling me that it's super overexposed. So do not rely on the light meter. Make sure that you take a look at your histogram. Some cameras don't have live Instagrams. That's one thing that I wanted to point out. But once you take the photo, you can go and check the, the, the histogram after you shoot. So do not rely on that focus. Do not rely on the light meter. Always keep your battery warm. I usually have it in my jackets. My winter jackets all have a chest pocket. I keep them there so I know that they are warm. <laughs> Uh, keep your camera warm too, and wipe the snow and and water as often as you can. I have several kind of microfiber towels that I'm using all the time on the camera. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, don't let this the the lens fog up. That just means keep your if you are shooting from the car and moving from location to location. Don't make the car too warm. Uh, it, it's. I know it's not nice, but you will have to keep the car like you know as cold as possible because as soon as you bring the camera in the car, everything is gonna fog up, and even the best lenses in the world are gonna be a disaster. You are not gonna be able to use them, so keep that in mind. So this is a quote from Ansel Adams that I really, I really like. He says, "In the sense that the negative is like the composer's scores, the print is the performance." So that's exactly how we, we feel about you know, post-processing. Here is the famous Moonrise over Hernandez. You see how the actual negative look on the left. And on the right, you can see what he did in, in, the, in the dark moon. And you know, he <laughs> famously say, dodging and burning are steps to take care of the mistake God made in establishing tonal relationships. He was the master of tonal relationships. Apparently, he didn't agree with, uh, with God sometimes. So how th this is one scene that I shot um, nearby, I think. And it's a wooden scene. It was it was uh, it's a woodland scene. It was snowing. And when I came home, uh, this is how the raw file looked. And I was like, this, there's no way. I mean, I had the sun right there on, on the where will be the, the right side of the frame. I know that it wasn't that flat, but that's how the camera registered. So I it's my duty in the post-processing to recover that detail. So that's what we want to see. And that's what Ansadam is called the, the performance, right? So how do I bring back to life that file? 
So there are a few, the, uh, you know, softwares that you can use. There are some of them that are non-destructive, that are raw processors, like uh, Lightroom or Capture One or Skylon Luminar. They are non-destructive and they basically work on raw, uh, raw images. Some of them give you also the, the chance to organize your images and all that stuff. And it's, it's very convenient. Uh, me personally, I use all the Adobe um, stuff. So like all the, the, the photography, the Lightroom, the uh, Photoshop, and also like, I, I mostly use Lightroom Classic. So Photoshop is for, just gives you better control. It gives you more control on the image and how you want to do that and how, on, how you want to process the image uh, at the tonal level. So, and you can make Photoshop non-destructive if you want to, it just makes the files very heavy. So that this is exactly what I use. I use the Adobe Creative Cloud for photographers. So that is in my personal workflow, I use Lightroom and then I go in Photoshop and I do some adjustments. Just so you guys have an idea of how it works with exactly the, the previous image that I show you, this is how the raw image will look. This is what I will do in, in Lightroom. So, you know, just fix general things in the photo. Lightroom is becoming better and better, but I still do the specific, um, when I need to address specific tonal ranges in the photo, I use a uh, Photoshop for that. And for example, when I finish with the photo in Lightroom, I realize, well, I do want to get a little bit more of the texture from the, <clears throat> from the, the trunks of the, of the trees. And the way to do that was going to be in, uh, you know, using Photoshop basically. So that's the kind of stuff that, that you can do in Photoshop that just recently, and I would say in the past year or so, you are going, you are starting to be able to do very similar things in, in Lightroom. So my excuse to go to Photoshop now is mostly sharpening. And um, sometimes when I want to, I, to most of my photos, I add a little bit of an Orton effect at the end. And that is really hard to accomplish properly in, in Lightroom. I actually, I mean, there are ways to do it, but I really don't like how it looks. So that's why I still use Photoshop for that. So a note on gear. <clears throat> the best camera is the one that you have with you and the one that you can use. So don't, tell, don't let anybody tell you that you cannot make landscape photography with iPhones because you can. If that's what you have and that's what you have, wh where you want to go, that's absolutely fine. This is, I took this photo with my, uh, with my uh, iPhone a couple of years ago. So it's, an, it's even an, an old iPhone, iPhone 10. And <clears throat> let me show you, this is after I edited in the phone. So I shot it in, in the iPhone X Max and I used Lightroom to, to take the photo in RAW. And then I edited that RAW file in the, in, in the iPhone. So you can do it. If that's what you want to do, you can totally do it. This is how I edit the photo. I am not gonna play this for you. I might actually upload this later in my Instagram so you guys can see this video of how I went from, from, one, from the raw file to the process file, but it just takes a little bit of time. So I don't want to do that. All right, gear for winter photography. <laughs> we won't have too much time for the photos. Um, you, you need a camera that is preferably weather sealed, but I mean, if, if you take, if you make sure that your car is not super warm and stuff like that, you just have to make sure that you are drying your camera all the time. So these are the stuff that I use. I always have a down quilt with me because sometimes I have to sit down and wait for a very long time. So I want to make sure that I'm warm. Also, I don't, I, I use a seat cushion because I'm with the one that I have has a high R, uh, number because you don't want to sit on the snow it's going to melt the snow and you're going to get wet and it's it's going to be a mess so always have a seat with you if you need to sit down for a while a heat socket a heat, a heated socks are amazing this is one of the best inventions that i have found and they 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 just make me happy when i get to the top of a mountain i can just press a button and then my my feet get warm as i am coming off the hike it's great and also heated gloves. 
Um, these are one of the best ones, the, the ORs, uh, but actually they just broke on me. So it's hit or miss with the heated gloves, but they are nice to have. So I, I don't like talking about gear. I include this slide here because I know people always want to know. So yes, I'm a, I'm a Nikon shooter. Um, you will find usually in my back um, the, C, the Z7 or the Z7 II with these three lenses, the 14 to 24, 24 to 120, and 100 to 400. And I also have the 1.4 teleconverter. So I can basically cover everything from 40 millimeters all the way to 500 and something um, in, in, in the bag. And it's relatively light. Um, and I've, I've been using Nikon for a very long time. I also use Fuji, I tested Sony. And as I said before, the, most, the best camera that you have is the one that you can use. And I feel very comfortable with Nikon and its files. So it's up to you. I have, I mean, Canon is great, Sony is great, Fuji is amazing too. I really love Fuji. Uh, Leica is great too. Shoot with whatever you can use. That's the most important thing. So on the field, I usually take a minute to enjoy the surrounders. Do that, always do that because you need to take that in. You need to understand what, what are you feeling. If you don't understand your feelings, you are not gonna be able to put that into a photo. Uh, ask myself what do I want from this scene what is it what is telling me I mean the, the scene is not telling me anything but I am putting in the context of all the things that I know and I do and I have shot before so it is very important that you do that little step and uh, what do I'm trying to say you know I'm trying to convey hope then I maybe I'm exposing a little bit more I'm a little bit somber so maybe I want to underexpose high key low key um, those are the things that you have to play with um, but try to be disciplined. Some non-tech uh, tips, do with intent, like mean it, you know? When, when you go there, try to be an artist. Um, you know, do whatever you have to do. Some people like to go on the ground to see a very low profile compositions. Do whatever you have to do, but shoot with intent. Don't just snap a photo because that, I mean, you can do that with your iPhone and you will be happy and that's it. But if you want to do something different, try different things. and ask all those questions that I mentioned before. Find a subject. That's one thing that you usually miss from when you see a photo and you feel lost in the photo, that means that there is not a clear subject. So find a subject and compose around that subject. If your subject can be texture, it can be color. It can be, of course, it can be a tree, it can be a person. Subject can be many things. But the important thing is that once you decide what is your subject, what your photo is about, com compose around it. Uh, learn all the rules. It's very important. Learn your rule of thirds, your, your uh, guiding lines, and all that stuff so you can break them. We don't want to care about uh, rules because, I mean, honestly, I I'll always feel that rule, uh, all those rules are really, you know, just uh, breaking your photography. <laughs> and the tripod, the tripod is my friend. I mean, you know, I, I love it because it slows me down, but at the same time, I hate it because it slows me down. So um, I try to keep the, the tripod on the side, so until I get the composition that I want. The iPhone helps me a lot. I have three lenses in the iPhone. I know one is about 15 millimeters. I know the second one is about 35 and the third one is about 50 to 60. So I can use the iPhone to find more or less what's the composition. I move around. I say, okay, yeah, this is more or less how I wanna frame things. In the, in the past, the people that were shooting films and large formats, they will have rulers that they will just use in the film. It's the same thing. It is exactly the same thing. So have the tripod because it will slow you down. Try not to use it until you find your composition because I mean, it also happens that when you have the tripod and you set it, then it's really hard to move it. You tend not to move that iPhone and that tripod anymore. So um, keep the tripod aside. Okay, so what makes winter so special? The, the light quality is unique. It's very different because if you think about the sun, I mean, at least up here in, in, in New York, the sun is very much in the south all the time and it's very low. Even, even at noon, still so, it's, low, it's relatively low in the horizon. So that will give a, a completely different um, atmosphere, if you might. And, and the, the light quality is just different because it's 
more it's going through more atmosphere to get to you so that can happen um textures are you know we have so much different kind of textures snow ice lots of sticks and twigs so you have to think about them and how you're going to use them in your company in your composition because you don't want it to be messy you can use snow for example to declutter the scene uh, if you see that there is there is this one tree that you really want to photograph it's a beautiful tree but during um you know I, if you haven't have any fresh snow you will for example see that it is too busy the, the scene is too busy and it's distracting well just wait for the next snowstorm and then go and shoot it because then you're going to have that tree by itself and it's going to help you with the composition uh, look out for temperature inversions because those are awesome. Every time that you have um, that you have fog and low clouds, you are going to be able to separate subjects, right? And that's one of the things that we are always looking for. We are always looking for separation, so that 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 is always convenient. And you know, weather events. Every time that you see a snowstorm, like all this week, I've been every, every time there is a snowstorm, I am like you know, biting my nails because I just want to go out and shoot because that's the, in my, in, in my humble opinion, that's the best time to do winter photography. Not, not only after, but also during the snowstorm. All right. So this is a good segue for, for the winter storms, right? So let's start showing some photos. So this was at the top of Cascade Mountain. mountain. I look at the forecast it seemed like there was going to be an inversion and i wanted to just go be there go and be there unfortunately the inversion was right at my height that's the thing with cascade we know that cascade is not super it's not super high um so sometimes you know the inversions get stuck on it but what that made is like when i was on the top of the mountain it was like there was a filter in front of the sun and it started to give all these crazy colors and all these textures in the in the landscape. And I couldn't help to, well, I mean, I, I might not have the big landscape, but now I can focus on these three that are looking amazing. And that's how I took this, the, this picture. This one on Cascade Mount, Mountain, not the same day. I was going exactly after the same conditions. This day, actually, the, con, the inversion did happen. Uh, but it, it, uh, if you guys have been in in, uh, in a mountain during inversions, you know that usually starts a little bit high, and as the day goes up, it starts coming down, coming down, coming down. So this was very early uh, in the morning, just when the sun was peaking over the mountain, and it was really, really, really amazing scenery. Um, it looks like otherworldly, uh, and I loved it. I was like, I'm not sure if I am under the water or what is this. It was amazing. I really love this photo. All right, this is in Blue Mountain. This is literally, I look at the forecast. There was a winter storm coming. It wasn't anything crazy. So I was like, well, I am going to just go up Blue Mountain. And, the, and I knew it was going to be heating around noon. And that's when sometimes you have to play it. You know that at noon, uh, generally speaking, uh, the, the sun, it's right at the top or as high as it's gonna be during the day. And it's usually a problem for photography, but if you know that you're gonna be um, photographing through a, a, through a storm, then you might get actually a chance with great light. And that's exactly what I went for. And I got super lucky that day. It, I was on the, on the fire tower on Blue Mountain because otherwise you are behind those trees that you see there at the bottom. And these trees here, and you, you don't get to peek into Blue Mountain Lake. So I went up the, the tower and I shot this photo, which I, I really like. The landscapes move, the, not the landscape, the, the weather systems move really fast when you're in a stormy situation. So you have to be ready to take that photo in the right moment. This was, no, this, this was a minor storm. <clears throat> and I've been planning to take this photo for maybe four or five years. Um, and I've been showing up to Topper Lake constantly because this is just by the road. I, I, hopefully some of you actually recognize this little um, island in the middle of Topper Lake because it's just by the, the, the road. 
And every time I drove by, I was like, wow, those two islands in the back are perfectly framing the island in the front. The problem is I have so much stuff in the background because it's like some little mountains, so little hills in, in the background. And there are houses also there too that just distract from the main subject. So I said, the only way that this is gonna work is with either fog or during a winter storm. And that was years ago. And I kept showing for, up for, I, I think about four years in both ends of the of, of winter, you know, at the, at, the, at the end of fall and during the winter. And finally last year, I could take a, I am very proud of this photo um, because it worked out pretty well. That That's exactly what you want. You want a situation where um, you have separation of the subject and you see that the, the composition is pretty well balanced. And you probably have seen the other uh, crop that I have from this photo. The frame is a little bit different, but it's basically conveying the same kind of mood and information. Same here. The most important thing in this, but I think that this is by the golf course, just sometimes this happens, you know, and um, you, all you need is a good amount of light. You can see here that I decided to overexpose that background because um, what I wanted was, were these textures. And what makes this photo to come alive is all that snow that is falling down. And you can see here the streaks of the slightly longer exposure of the snow coming down. And that gives that adds texture over texture that sometimes can be too much, but in this case worked just fine. Very similar situation. <clears throat> in this case, the, it, it was a, also a minor uh, snow shower. Um, <clears throat> and that sometimes helps if you have the sun, if you have a very small layer of, of clouds that are the ones that are basically pouring out the snow, um, the sun can come through it like a filter. And that creates a lot of depth when you are doing this kind of woodland uh, photography. Now, what, we, what becomes a little bit challenging is that you have to make a, a decision or how long you want to expose, because you can see here all those little streaks that you see there that you can barely see, <clears throat> those are all basically the snow falling. So I had to make a relatively long exposure here. It was about, I, if I remember well, it was one sixth of a second. And what that did too is that that let me overexpose a little bit the top. So it is a very high key feeling kind of photo, but I really like how it came out, mostly because I mean, I have a lot of textures over, over texture and there is depth and the depth is created uh, by the snow falling and the light being trapped, you know, by the snowflakes as, as they are coming. So it happens the same with rain. If you happen to shoot in rain, you can create depth just, and sometimes you don't even need the camera. You just look, uh, if you're in a lake, for example, you see how all of the sun, the, the, you, you have a different depth per perception because all of the sun, the, the rain takes care of the light as, you, as it goes, um, as you're trying to see far away. Same thing. And, I, and I, what I want you is to see how the themes work here. Again, the subject still, you know, those branches and I mean the the trees and the branches, and I will say the secondary subject is the textures, right? And how all these in the foreground interplay with these branches in the back, and what that is giving me is depth, and it it, it makes me flow into the into the photo. So this is an example of how some of those these scenes can look. Um, this is one tree that I, I felt always that it has so much character that I just keep coming back to it. And I kept coming back to it in, during winter because I was looking, I was trying to do something like that. And I say, well, I mean, this is, this is also a willow and it should be I should be able to work it, but the problem is that you need the right conditions. And that's what right conditions do for you. When you have right conditions, the other thing is that the, the composition might be guided differently. 
because now I have snow on these branches here that are falling down. And those, I am using those branches with the snow as lines that are taking me inside of, of, the, of the frame, right? I still have some uh, background that I'm using to stop the eye. And those are the, the trees that are in the back that you can barely see that they are all over the frame. But that immediately what tells you is that you have to look at the texture of this tree that is right here in the front. So if you see something that captures your eyes, there, there might be a reason for that. Try to find it uh, and you will find yourself coming back again and again and again. I mean, I have a few landscapes that I come back many times. One of them is the uh, it's giant ball um, because the the light interacts with that landscape in a very different way depending on the time of the year that you are in so it is very good it, it is a good place to learn how to read light in the landscape so this is the same day that i was in blue mountain that i that the photo that i show you from the from the fireplace from sorry from the fire tower and i was looking at these trees and I really like them because they were all by themselves, this bunch here, and they have the other ones in the back. And the light was just delightful. I could see, you know, the light coming uh, coming from the from the right, and they were hitting the the trees on the side. Uh, somebody was there, so they step in there, and I wasn't sure if I wanted those steps. I know that I can take out those steps, as I say, I don't add anything to my photos. But this kind of stuff, distractions, I will very likely clone out. I, I will probably just, you know, clone them out if, I, if they really bother me. But what was bothering me here was really the, the composition. I, I felt like even though the subject was interesting, it, it kind of got lost. So I decided to just do something slightly different. I decided to do a uh, multiple exposures. And this, you know, this is why it is important to read a lot and to get acquainted with other pe people's work. Uh, there's a guy uh, from, from Spain called Pep Bemtosa. Uh, Bemtosa, what he does is that he takes multiple exposures uh, to create some sort of an impressionistic vibe into the landscape. And he, he's also an urban photographer, so he just doesn't work on landscape. He works also on cities and stuff like that. Um, and because these trees were right there in the middle and everything in the back wasn't moving too much, I decided, well, let me try uh, uh, one of those Tosa kind of tricks. So basically what, what I started doing is I set my camera in multi exposures. The cool thing about these new digital cameras is that you can take the photo and then you can look at it and you can move and then take the second exposure and you see exactly how it's overlaying. So I went for another one and I made for another one and that's exactly how I got the last one, right? So you can see that it's kind of a dreamscape. This has more atmosphere. It's giving me a, a sense of um, of wonder, you know, I look at this and I'm, I don't really know what I'm exactly looking at. And I, I, I love that I could do that with this subject, but it, it just uh, a test for, you know, just go out there, get creative. There are other techniques. Uh, one of them is called ICM, Intentional Camera Movement. That is basically you use a long, uh, a long shutter speed and you move the camera to create shapes. I do that a lot, and I'm, sure I'm gonna show you a couple of examples a little bit. This is literally a mile away from my house. This is on the Mohawk River in East Cayuna. Again, a beautiful morning last year. Um, and I could all, all I could see was this tree, and I was like, well, how I compose a photo that captures what those beautiful shapes that I'm seeing for that tree and that preserve the textures that are being um, in, in a way dodge, you know, in a way highlighted by the sun heating from the side. And I love this thing, I love it. This is another one that is local. This is the Alpine uh, Bush Preserve. And I included these ones here because I, that's another thing that I want to emphasize, you know, the, the, the advantage of the, of the backyard, right? We are very lucky that we live in basically submerged in a beautiful landscape. For those of you that are leaving the Adirondacks, you are even more lucky than I am because I still have to drive at least half an hour to be uh, across the blue line. Uh, but um, this is about 15 minutes away from, 
from my house in the Alba, uh, Albany Pine Bush Preserve. And there are subjects that are absolutely amazing there. You just have to take the time and go there. Um, I have seen so many people, you know, trying to go out west to take beautiful photos. Yeah, those subjects are beautiful, but we have so much in the Adirondacks. We have so much locally that, I mean, if you really want to do photography, all you have to do is just take your camera and go out. This is the same, the same day, different situation, just showing different kind of compositions. Um, the, in this one, you can see that my shutter was a little bit longer. So you can barely see the snow, but it's in there. So it is adding texture and it's adding atmosphere. <clears throat> one thing that I do want you, want you to notice too, um, I am trying to frame these photos in such a way that I don't have any um, highlights that are very much um, in your face. So what, what I'm trying to say is like, for example, in here, uh, there could be a little hole and actually here was more evident, like here at the top of the screen, there will be a little branch that didn't have a lot of needles, and but the composition kept going up. And that is very tempting to say, well, you know, I really want to get all these trees because they are so beautiful. But yeah, but I have that huge hole in there that is going to be a distraction. So frame the photo, compose the photo in such a way that you don't have distractions and that your subject is where all the attention goes. So that's why I always say, find the subject and then compose around the subject. Because if you compose a photo just based on the scene without a subject, then you can, the same way that, that, um, that you are actually lost in the composition, your viewer, when they look at the photo, they are gonna be lost too. So find a subject, clear subject, compose around it. All right, so now after the storm, um, well, sometimes, you can just come after because the thing is that usually after storms, you have gray lights, right? You have those beautiful sunsets or those beautiful sunrises, and it's absolutely worth it. <clears throat> this was this is Pickett Mountain. So I took the trail in 13th Lake. And it I mean it, it wasn't packed at all. I was the one who was uh, uh, opening uh, that, that trail, but it took me way longer than I hope. But I mean, usually, you know. It's so rewarding because you get this kind of open scenes that are just amazing. Um, yeah, I love I love picked and I love being also at the top up there. The the view is amazing. <laughs> this one is on Blue, uh, Blue Mountain Lake. The um, the location escapes my my mind right now, uh, but it's just black by Blue Mountain Lake. Um, I cannot believe that I cannot remember the name of this lookout, but um, some of you probably know. <laughs> and again, you know, frozen lake, you don't have the texture of the water. You can take something very similar in summer, but you will have to do a long exposure. Then all the problems that come with long exposure, right? If you have a long exposure, then the trees, if, if there is a little bit of wind and the trees are moving, then that is also going to blur out. So winter is the perfect moment to take this photo and i got super lucky with that beautiful beautiful sunrise uh, this is on blue mountain so not too far from there um again in the trail you know sometimes you're gonna come across these beautiful scenes the symmetry works here perfectly yes guilty as charge i'm almost using here the rule of third <laughs> but i mean this the, the, I didn't use, I didn't come into the scene thinking I'm gonna use a rule third. It, it was just the composition that gave the, the best uh, framing for me. This is another cautionary tale. Big landscapes, right? This is a panorama on Lake Placid. I actually, I was standing on the lake um, that moment, I think it was somewhere in, in March or something like that. Beautiful up, up in glow. It, it was a great vista. I didn't know what to shoot. I, I couldn't make my mind what to shoot. So I decided, you know what? I'm going to just shoot the whole thing. I'm going to shoot the panorama. Um, and if you look at the panorama, this is a beautiful panorama. The problem is that your eye doesn't know where to go. So even though it's a nice document for the scene and for the moment, it is not a great photograph because your eye doesn't know where to go. Um, I was lucky that I actually... As I showed as a panorama, I have all those individual frames. 
and I came across this frame and this frame for me works perfectly, right? We have a clear subject. We have a secondary subject that is the McIntyre's in the back with all that Alpen, Alpen glow coming on the from the side. And this makes a more compelling picture than this one. Even though this is a you know, great document of the scene, but this is a better photograph. Now, storylines examples. This is actually uh, something that I've been doing lately. And that, that is that I come sometimes to, to a scene or on a trip with a storyline that I want to, to, to fulfill, you know? Um, in this case, I mean, I, I was there with uh, one good friend and I, I was gonna be climbing Amperson. And we came early enough because we wanted to document what was happening in the bottom. So we said, well, why don't as we start climbing the mountain, we start shooting all the way up to the top. So we had a good fresh from the night before. And this is the kind of scene that, you know, when you set your mind, not to the summit, but to the journey, this is the kind of scene that you're gonna come across. And this is so rewarding because I mean, those little tweaks are there. And most of the time you're just gonna hike by them and you're not gonna see them. But if you pay attention, there is many stories to be told in, 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 in the trail per se. So I love this uh, twig. I, I think I spent maybe like 20 minutes trying to photograph it in the best way. It's one of my favorites. And then I came across this one. And I love this one so much because I could see the shadow of the tree that was behind it going right through it. It was put in the middle. I have these lines here of the shadow also pointing at the twig. Beautiful light coming from the back, backlighted. Um, and that's how we were seeing the bottom. I mean, we, I mean these were not the only twigs that, that we photographed. Of course, there were many more, but these were the best ones. Um, you're also going to see a lot of these kind of um, because the, the light is still, this was, I think, allowed around 3 p.m. You still have um, the light is coming from the south. So it is it was going to create very long uh, shadows. So you start working, you start seeing those shadows, and you're all, shadows are lines, right? So all you want to see is how you can work with those lines to create a photo. So here is a frame. Uh, it, it wasn't telling me much. So I was like, how can I make it different? How I can make this scene come to life in a different way. So that's when I use ICM, intentional camera movement. And it was so hard for me actually to put those two, these two together in, in the presentation because usually when you are moving the camera, you never move it exactly in the same way. So I had to find a way to kind of center it so you will see where it comes from. But this is what you usually get from intentional camera movement. Again, this is a normal scene that you will shoot. This is after you move it. And you see that, you know, it doesn't give you, it, again, it's an impression, right? It's not a depiction exactly. This is it's art. So you do, after you kind of start doing that, you say, well, maybe I have a slightly different uh, way to frame the whole, the whole uh, scene. Because um, if you have a bunch of tweaks that were in the middle and they were not letting you put, have a clear composition or a clean composition, then, well, if I am moving the camera, things are going to be slightly different. So be creative, you know? Um, I made it uh, to the top on time for sunset. And this is kind of a cautionary tale. Um, this composition is definitely a little bit forced, right? I mean, I don't have a clear line. I kind of, you can say that I can go through this way into the, the into the, um, um, in, into the flow of the photo to get into the composition. I have these two lines coming there. I have beautiful sky, but this is not really working. And the reason is because, you know, the sun is gonna set where the sun sets. Um, it's really hard to make that decision uh, on the spot. Even if you plan it with photo peels or whatever application you're using to plan exactly where your sun is gonna be, um, unless you are up there, and you realize how the shadows are working because you, for example, you see this big shadow here, this is breaking the flow of the, of the, of the photo. So that's the kind of stuff that you have to keep in mind. A much better composition is this one. 
right now we have lines coming here to the top. I have this dark line coming here, this line coming here. And that happened after sunset because after sunset, I can make a decision of, you know, where I'm going to point the camera um, because I don't have the main subject that is the sun over the horizon, right? So now my subject becomes the sky and the, and the foreground. So that's the kind of stuff that you have to keep in mind. Always in the Adirondacks, by the way, always stay after the sunset because um, I, I usually call it the second sunset. But the light, these kind of crazy um, colors, they always come after the sun, the sun is down because it's basically the, the light of the sun refracting to the top of the clouds that are of you. So if you see high clouds and a beautiful sunset, stay for a little bit longer because you're going you're gonna to be in for a treat. So the sun keeps going down. Now the open globe comes. This is looking <clears throat> now, I will say, southeast towards the, uh, the, the, the high peaks. This is Person Lake. And <clears throat> you can see, you know, I, again, I'm telling the story of the same day. You know, I started with a twig. Now I am looking at the big vistas in the mountains. And I stay a little bit longer. And I was treated to a beautiful, uh, moonrise and this is basically my favorite photo of the day I didn't plan it at all usually you, I plan my moonrise pictures this one came out of nowhere I knew the moon was going to rise I just didn't know where I was going to be on the mountain at the, at, at the moment but it worked perfectly the moon was I, I was able to move so I could frame the moon between these two guys <clears throat> and it worked out really nicely so once the moon is out, the moon will also, you know, uh, it's really hard to shoot with moonlight, but it is possible. And this is the example. You can still see some stars there at the top. The beautiful thing of having the moonlight at, at night is that the, all the clouds are going to look white. If the, moon, if the moon is not out there, the clouds usually look a little bit like murky and, and like grayish. So, if this is kind of uh, a scene that you're looking for, shooting with the moonlight is great. The only thing is that the moon, if it's really high up, it's going to be just like the sun, right? It's, it, it's going to create dark, very dark shadows, and the light is not going to have much character. So you just have to keep that in mind when you're going to shoot in the, in the moonlight. This is, again, another of those photos shot in, in moonlight. Uh, in this case, this was in late, um, this, was, this was almost spring, actually. Um, this was very late winter. And beautiful split rock falls night. Uh, there was some fresh snow, the rocks, and you can see all those textures. And what makes, I really think, for example, in this case, the moonlight worked perfectly on over this shot. This is Giant Snowball. This is one of those locations that I come back uh, often. And if you see my fall photo from this location, the composition is slightly different because the, the lines work slightly differently. Here in winter, I can use the foreground as lines that, you know, make me flow to the, to the inner part of the, of the composition. While in summer, uh, this actually just is messy and it just is distracting. You get stuck in there in the composition. So that's what winter helps with. The, Snow usually decores the scene. It makes it way easier to compose and you have clear lines and stuff like that. This is also Blue Mountain uh, Lake, the same lookout that we saw before. Actually, you can see that this little thing here is the composition that I was showing you before. The Mickey Way in winter uh, actually already picked up a lot in Early February is the first time that we can see again the, the core of the Milky Way over the horizon at night. It's usually in the early, um, well, I will say in the late night. So usually like at four in the morning and stuff is that you can see the, the Milky Way rising. It's usually going to be in, um, very inclined. So you want to think of compositions where the Milky Way in that angle is going to work. In summer, it's usually standing up but in winter it's on the side. So you want to usually use landscape kind of uh, orientation for your photos. 
and look for scenes that are gonna work. For example, here, I mean, I purposely was trying to frame this in such a way that this line of the Milky Way kind of follows this line here of the foreground. So that, that's how you make the elements of the composition talk to each other geometrically. Uh, this is on the Norman Ridge in Vermontville. This is north of Lake Placid. Again, very similar. Uh, one thing that you can see here is that and, uh, down here, there is a lot of uh, like contamination. That's because Lake Placid is right there. So we can see all those lights. But you can either uh, hate it and go you know, shoot somewhere else where you don't have that, or you can embrace it and try to use it uh, for your composition. I actually love the weird colors that that kind of brings to, to the Milky Way. And I try to use that as, um, uh, for my composition. So uh, that's how this one uh, worked for me. And this, this mountain back here, that's white face. This is Serenac Lake. Again, you know, uh, late winter. Um, I, this photo I put together a slightly different. The, the reason why you see so much detail in the Milky Way is because I track these photo basically I, I you use a device that helps you track the movement of the Milky Way so you can get more detail you can make longer exposures and then you make a long exposures for the foreground and you combine those two uh, to be completely honest it can be a pain um, and if you're printing um in a1 paper uh, yeah even in a1 you're not gonna see the details, the different details between this photo and this photo. So tracking is awesome because you can expose for longer. And if you love, you know, astrophotography and the data and you are not, if that's, I mean, that's your thing. I would say go track. If you, what you want is to print your photos for yourself and all that stuff, you don't need to track. So temperature inversions. Uh, well, we already talked about temperature inversion. This is from that Cascade Mountain day that you saw at the beginning that looked like it was the corals and stuff. Um, that was that day. You see how it went all the way from the top. Now it is down and just being um, all under cast over the, the Great Range. And and uh, yeah, we have here Gothics and this is the big slide. Beautiful. That's Algonquin from Cascade. It's actually from another day. Um, that the, the, the sky was super clear. I don't think I left a lot of time for questions, so I'm going to go into acknowledgement and solid. I kind of rush. I really wanted to show you most of the pictures. So yeah, I wanted to thank you know, of course, the family that is the one that have to put up with this, and also uh, my folks at I get Vector Research, my my coworkers that are great and very encouraging of my work as a photographer, and the Adirondack like Trust and Derek for reaching out and giving me the opportunity, Mike as well. And the Interval Lowlands Preserve and Jeff Berry that we are hopefully going to meet on, on Saturday. Manny, thank you so much. That was truly amazing to see your work. Wow, I mean, yeah. it gave me a lot of uh, insight, especially as a, as a wildlife person. I mean, there's a lot of overlap, I feel like. You know, one of the things that, that you said that seems so simple is study the masters. And I think it's so easy for all of us to get kind of caught up in our own work. Um, right. It's so important to remember that, you know, uh, you know, if you get in a block or something and just to study the masters. So that leaves me with a question. Um, do you have a blog or what's the best way for people to stay connected with you and your work? That's a, that's a great question. So, yes, I'm going to start. Uh, um, I, I used to have a blog in my website and now it, it is gone and I am going to start doing it again. Um, Instagram in a way has been a, a blog for me. So if you go to Instagram, I usually talk about, I give a little bit of context to the shots that I'm sharing, you know, like how I did it, why I did it. Um, and the blog is coming back at some point <laughs> right. this year, but, but right now I mean, Instagram will be the best way to connect with me. Okay. And that's zone three photography, right? A zone three photo. Don't three photo. I, yeah, great. Yeah, just, yeah, just like here. Okay. Manny, I'm going to get into some participant questions now. Um, All right. Do you use a sharpening software beyond Adobe? So for, for instance, any plugins like the Topaz Labs or, or things like that? Yeah, Topaz Lab. Yep. <laughs> yes, Topaz is the best one. So yep. I have okay. tried everything out there. 
I have I I literally have tried everything out there. And Topaz is hands down the best one. The only thing is that you have to be careful. It's very easy to over sharpen with it. So depends what you're trying to sharpen. So for example, these winter photos, for some of them, I can I can point out actually, uh, just give me one sec. Like a specific, like specifically this one. Oh, where is it? Gosh. Well, while you're looking, I mean, I've had the same experience with wildlife. I use Topaz uh, Labs, Denoise and Sharpen. And you have to be yep. very careful with overdoing it, but I find them to be unbelievably good programs. Yeah, no, it, it is great. And I, I'm gonna give you a trick. So if you use Photoshop, because I mean, if you're using Topaz, I'm guessing that you're using, uh, using it as a pl plugin in Photoshop. So what you want to do is to apply it just where you need it. And the best way is either, for example, in this photo, I didn't want to sharpen the highlights. I wanted to, sharp, to sharpen only the, the mid-tones. So I apply a mid-tone layer, um, lum luminosity layer. So if you learn how to use luminosity masks and then you combine that with Topaz, you're gonna to have absolute control on your sharpening. So Topaz Great. is the best one, hands down. I, I, I totally agree. <laughs> and we'll, we'll send that out to folks if they're interested. It's called Topaz Labs, but when we follow up with an email, there'll be a survey. We'd love to hear from everybody. We'll, we'll follow up with some of the additional information that we're discussing now. So thanks for that insight, Manny. Um, here's another one, and I think feel like this could probably be a dedicated session on this topic alone, but can you tell us <laughs> about PhotoPill or any other smartphone tips or resources that you can point folks towards? Oh my gosh. So yeah, that's, you're absolutely right. Uh, PhotoPills yeah. is, is, a, is an app on the iPhone that helps you to, um, to basically plan your, your shots either for Milky Way, but I use them mostly really for to know where the sun is going to be when I'm shooting. So it will give you the position of the sun and the moon. And it will also tell you, for example, you can tell PhotoPills, hey, I'm shooting with my 24 millimeters. I want to cover this much, this much land and it knows already what's the angle of view of your 24 uh, with um, a large format sensor or whatever sensor you have. And you know exactly what area you're gonna be covering. So it, 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 there are a lot of tools there. I also use one that is called TPE, Photo Ephemeris or something like that. Um, that is very good. Uh, there is one that is the, the best one of all of those is one that is really hard to use. It's called Planet Pro. And Planet Pro is, is amazing. It has everything. It has, that's how I, um, that's how I shot my, how I plan my, sh my shots of the, of Neowise because it has the comets information that PhotoPills doesn't have um, and stuff like that. So there are a lot of tools out there um, and it's important, you know, I mean, it's really important to know how this, the light, the sun is going to be positioned in your landscape. Sure. So, well, on the topic of tools and resources, here's a, a common theme we got for an equipment question. What kind of covers do you use for your camera? How do you keep your lens dry and your camera dry while photographing in snow and rain? So there are two things. I, I use one thing called uh, the storm jacket. It's called, uh, that's the name of the thing. That's just a jacket that you put on top of the camera. Uh, but more often, I just use a microfiber. Uh, I wish I had a little bit closer to me so I would pick it up. But it's basically a huge towel. It is a big, big towel. And I just use that all the time to, to uh, just you know wipe the camera uh, as often as I can. It's very important to keep it. And with Sony cameras, you have to be really careful because Sony cameras, if, if the hot shoot gets wet, that's it, you're done shooting for the day. It's, it's a pain. And that happened to me and that's, it was right when I was making my decision what camera to buy. And that's how I went Nikon because I was like, that has never happened to me in the past. So I'm gonna stick with what I know. <laughs> that's good advice for sure. Um, Here's another one. How do you organize and manage photos? Do you use Lightroom or something else? Um, and, and how do you store your, your huge photo library, which I'm sure is quite enormous in size? Yes, so I have a, a, a RAID at home 
and that's where I keep all my photos. It's a four drive RAID. So I basically, if one of those hard drives fail, I still can recover all the information from it. Um, and I use I use Lightroom for everything. I keep all my libraries are in Lightroom, and that's that's where everything lives. Um, I have a secondary backup online with a, a Black Blaze, I think is the name. Yes, Black Blaze. Black Blaze. <laughs> Black Blaze. So if if I have a catastrophic uh, hardware failure, I know I still have all those pictures online. It costs a little. I mean, it is a service, and it costs a little bit of money because if if I need to get those back, they are not gonna let me download it. I can I can, but it's it's about twenty terabytes by now. So it's just gonna take forever. So they send you a physical hard drive for that. And that's called Backblaze? Backblaze, yeah. Backblaze, okay, great, yeah. thank you. Okay, let's see, we, I know we had a couple more in here. Um, what Sky Tracker and what stacking program do you use? So I, I am on a Mac. So the stacking software that I use is called Ster, Ferry Sky Stacker or hold on, and the other one is Stary Landscape Stacker. Uh, I used to do all my stacking in Photoshop, but this software is so far superior uh, and I like way better what it does. So once I discovered the Stary Landscape Stacker, I stopped using Photoshop for my stacking. Uh, there are some things that I still stack in Photoshop, but uh, it, it's only when this software, software fails. So, but I know that there is not a, I mean, that there is not a window equivalent. I, I, I think there is, but it's not that great. So yeah, Sterling State Stacker and my tracker. I wish I could tell you what brand it is uh, that I could remember, but I don't. <laughs> so okay. I can, just send me a I, I I will I will send you exactly what I what I'm using. That sounds great. Thank you so much, um, Manny. Any photography shops in the region you can recommend? We have someone that's looking to clean the sensor on their Canon. Um, but also just interested in, you know, uh, shopping for lenses or just a good shop in general that they can go to. So I, I, I get everything through B&H. So that, that's the, um, unfortunately, I don't, I, don't, I don't have a relationship with any photo store locally. Um, I don't even know if we have any photo store locally, which is pretty sad. Uh, but I acquire most, most of my gear in BNH and I clean my sens the sensors myself. And you know, if you are gonna go into mirrorless, that is something that you have to get very comfortable with because unfortunately, as with all the advantages that mirrorless have, the big disadvantage is that every time you're gonna change your lens, you're gonna be exposing your, your sensor to the elements. And guess what? It's gonna get dusty. It's a mess. So, if you have mirrorless, get used to be, you know, cleaning your sensor yourself. They, um, in B&H and even Amazon, they have some swabs that work perfectly. You just have, they are the actual size of the sensor and you just swap the sensor one direction. You never use them again. You dispose them after you use them once. So you don't have, you know, scratch the sensor. That's the most okay. important thing. I've always um, been too yeah. scared. I've always been too scared to do that, but now that now that you say it, it makes me feel a little bit more confident in doing it myself. Um, I, we have one more question before I wrap up with some uh, just a, a few words. Um, you gave a, a lot of great advice, but is there one last quick tip on how to improve color slash mood? I use a smartphone, and this well, is... shoot raw. Okay, so even in your phone, shoot raw. Uh, because RAW is going to give you access to all the information, the color information of the scene that you're shooting. Um, and, and that's the most important thing. You want all the range of tones in, the in each of the colors. So if Got you it. have that, then you're going to be able to, you know, open those colors in, in post. Um, if once you're in JPEG, it's baked and that's it. Great. Okay. Well, Manny, thank you so much for your time. Um, and everybody else for being here. This was really, really fun. I, I'm quite inspired right now. Um, and I just wanted to give folks a heads up um, to please be on the lookout for some of our, our spring newsletter, which is coming out very soon. It's going to feature some additional upcoming events and field trips um, from the Land Trust and other ways to get involved in our work. Um, here are a, a few, of that, few of the trips that we'll be, we'll be featuring this coming spring. 
Um, so hope to see you on some of those. Thank you again so much for being here. Have a great day, everybody. And um, please keep in touch.